I'm David Knowles, and this is a special episode of Ukraine, the latest. Over the past two weeks in Ukraine, we've spoken to a huge number of people from almost every sphere of Ukrainian life. I've spoken to students in school, parents in mourning, military commanders, and caught up with my friends to hear their thoughts on the challenges facing the country. Last week, we had the opportunity to speak to Andrei Kirkov, one of Ukraine's most prominent novelists. At 62, Kirkov has had a long and illustrious literary career. A novelist, diarist, children's author, and scriptwriter, it can feel like the author of the world-famous Death and the Penguin has done it all. Kirkov invited us to his apartment in the heart of Kyiv to talk about literature, the war, and the future of the Russian language in Ukraine. Silently, he poured us coffee as we set up our recording equipment. Then we started talking. Here's our conversation. Well, Andre, thank you so much for your time and thank you for inviting us to your beautiful apartment here in the heart of Kiev's old town. Can I start by asking a fairly broad question? This week, obviously, we're marking the anniversary of the full-scale invasion, but it's also been 10 years since the Revolution of Dignity, since Maidan. How do you think Ukrainian society and culture has changed in that time? I would say, actually, the society changed very radically. I remember all the changes starting from 91, 1992, because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Ukrainian youth and the young intellectuals were in principle apolitical, including artists and writers. So writers didn't want to write novels about social issues, political issues. And then the first change happened in 2004, after Orange Revolution. Then we had the first social issues as topics of uh, essays and prose. And uh, from 2014, from Euromaidan, of course, the civil society became very militant, very active. And since then, the civil society in Ukraine is much stronger than political elite. So political elite is afraid of civil society, is afraid of potential protests on the streets. Because Ukrainians, if they are unhappy, they go out, they go on the street, they organize Maidan protests, etc. So what we have now, I mean, from one point of view, the Ukrainians became much more radical, much more militant. From the other side, Ukrainians became conscientiously very pro-European and very European. And in this sense, when they are defending Ukraine now, they are also defending their and their family's European future. Could you take us back to maybe some of your memories of Maidan? It's not too far away from here, obviously. And maybe then fast forward and tell us about the first night of the full-scale invasion. I read Luke Harding's book, and I believe he was here for dinner. He was on the 23rd of February (laughs) here. What happened? Uh, No, I mean, I cooked borscht, and and we were joking. We were eating over there, uh, this table. Probably there were a dozen of us good friends, and uh, a couple of journalists, Luke Hardin and Tim Judah, who writes for New York Times, review of books. And uh, I was saying that probably this is the last borscht in Kiev. So far, it was last borscht in Kiev for them here. But generally, I mean, the mood was quite sober, and uh, the jokes didn't provoke much smiles. And after midnight, on already on the 24th, when we were saying goodbye to each other, suddenly everybody started exchanging mobile telephone numbers with each other, just in case. And I took photos of this moment. So, I mean, the the, the, all the faces of guests were very worried and very concerned, and there were no smiles at all. Take us forward a few hours then, when the invasion started. What were the first things you did? How did you find out? Well, we were woken up by the explosions, very well heard, although they were far away, they were seven kilometers away from here, approximately. But I jumped up at five o'clock and I rushed to the window. I was looking over there at the street. The street was empty and I felt paralyzed. Like for 40 minutes I didn't move and the street didn't move and there was no life there. And then quarter to six, 20 to six in the morning, there was a neighbor lady coming out with two small dogs to this small park. And at 6 a.m. there were two more explosions. And then actually I already accepted that this is a real war. I was expecting escalation in Donbass. I I wasn't expecting 1941 style of bombing the whole country like Hitler did. 
And then around seven o'clock, we went with my wife to check on the shelters around. And then we went to see our friends and have tea in Redison Hotel. And at this time, actually, Redison Hotel was full of journalists. There were probably several hundred of them. And they were rushing out from the hotel with the cameras, with their cases, and telling each other which part of Ukraine they will go to cover the war. And there was some kind of strange excitement in the atmosphere. How did you feel in those early days, knowing as we know now that the Russians did have lists of people that they were going to vanish or arrest, intellectuals, artists, if they did manage to get to Kiev? What did you do when you considered that? And how did that impact you in, in the early days? Well, I didn't think about this until a person I know called me and said that I should disappear as quickly as possible. But I mean, I didn't take it seriously. And we first wanted to go to our countryside house, which is one hour drive from here. And uh, we agreed uh, on 25th in the morning, we agreed that we are picking up our friend and her son on the way. And it looked like the road was more or less empty. But once we were on the road, the GPS showed that it was all red blocked and we got stuck. Actually, we got stuck several kilometers away from Gostomel and we were listening to the artillery fire and the jets were flying over the cars and my wife saw a shell flying over our car. And I, I didn't notice, I was just waiting for this uh, traffic jam to move forward. But I didn't realize at the time that these were the cars from all around Ukraine, because this is the only uh, direct way to the Western border. And we spent most of this day, actually, uh, in traffic jams. We managed to get to our village house, and we were thinking of staying there. And then the same person called me and said, where are you? I said, we are in our village house. And he said, no, just get back into your car and drive further because the tanks, Russian tanks, are moving in your direction. So we managed actually to get on the Zhitomir Highway and uh, towards Zhitomir before Russians cut off uh, the traffic, cut the highway. That's a very close escape. Yeah. That was very early on. Did you feel in those early months then that your job might have to change in terms of what you did, in terms of writing and what you were focused on? No, it changed. Immediately I couldn't think about continuing writing novel, which I was writing before 24th of February. I had already 70 pages uh, written and I had the whole story in my head. And I was first, of course, I, on the first day I couldn't write almost any, nothing, a couple of sentences in the diary. And then I was writing diary and articles and giving interviews and giving talks. I mean, I felt sorry for myself that I cannot write fiction, but at the same time I was thinking that it is probably one of the biggest scenes <laughs> in the wartime when a writer writes fiction but not uh, really writes about reality. Why? Well, because uh, for me, writing is pleasure. Uh, the process of writing for me is more important than the release of the book. <laughs> so when I'm writing, I'm like alive two times at the same time. I'm living in two worlds, the world I created for the novel and the world uh, with my real friends, real family and real problems. And so my imaginary life was immediately cut off, was like removed from me. And I did try to get back to writing this novel many times. I failed, failed, failed. Then I managed to write 30 pages last summer when we were in the village. And several days ago, I managed to write half a page. Half a page? Yeah. Do you feel like you'll be able to write more soon? How did that feel for you writing that? Page? I'm fighting with myself. I'm yeah. trying. Uh, I mean, I've done so many articles. I published more than 100, probably 20 articles in these two years. Uh, I, I think I, I wrote everything I could write. I mean, of course, I get more information from my sources and I use them and I write more and more articles every week. I think actually now I paid with my articles for the possibility to spend at least one hour a day writing <laughs> my novel. Something that lots of people I talk to say in Ukraine is that they, and they usually say it with a sort of half a smile, they say they found a war-life balance, not work-life balance, but a war-life balance. Is that something you found uh, now maybe uh, two no, years No, I was in? not. I mean, there were the, for me, balance or harmony is, is uh, incompatible with the war. I would say uh, people adopt to the war. And actually this book, The Grey Bees, is about how people adapt to the war. And the war changes their lives, but they accept it. They understand that they cannot change the war, especially if they are not generals or 
They don't have weapon. So, uh, I mean, I learned a lot of things. I learned how to cross border by car. I learned how to find easier routes on the roads in Ukraine. I, I think I learned a lot. But that doesn't mean that uh, I am happy because of this knowledge. <laughs> no, I am more experienced. I mean, I I know what uh, to do if I hear air raid alert. So I'm checking the reason for this alert. Is it just one jet taking off in Russia or is it uh, 20 bombers which are flying from Murmansk region to Caspian Sea in order to launch missiles against us from there? So then I'm taking seriously the danger. And when you look back on these two years of the full-scale war, what memories come back to the top of your mind? When you think of these years, what will you remember? Uh, I've lost friends. Because, I mean, uh, I was following several of my friends and families who became refugees, uh, who didn't manage to become refugees, who became displaced persons, who were on the way not knowing what they want to do. And then there is a family mentioned in my diary, uh, Valentin and Tatiana Suslovy, older people, uh, retired people. He, he, he had actually his legs amputated just before the full-scale invasion because of the diabetes. And then his wife was trying to get him out uh, of Kiev, and it was almost impossible. And when actually she found a place for him in the train, which was taken kids with cancer from Kiev's hospital to Western Ukraine, he refused to go with them. He didn't want to take place. He just was panicking, thinking that he will take place of a child. And in the end, actually, they managed to get to Germany and they settled in Mainz near Frankfurt. I visited them twice there. And then last year in September, he died. And it was difficult for her to organize cremation and then to come to organize funeral. And actually, a week ago, she died already in Kiev. And so the, their story is finished, is over. I mean, the, the, the war finished their story. So stories like this, I just, in a way, keep my thoughts under control. Can we talk about Grey Bees? You mentioned it earlier. As I said, I read it on the night train on the way here. Um, which is quite an experience with the sort of light coming in and out and some people we were traveling with eating crisps very loudly. And mm -hmm. <laughs> several things struck me. Can I ask you about, there's a moment when Sergeyevich goes into Crimea and on the border post, he's interrogated and they find the messages to Petro, the Ukrainian soldier. And it's a live question mark. And they say, who's that? Who's that? Which side? Which side? And Sergeyevich says, he just lives there. He just lives there. What I wanted to ask was, can you write characters like that anymore when it comes to the full-scale war? People who maybe just want to be left alone, <laughs> just want to live in a place, don't necessarily want to be claimed by either side. Is that something that maybe has gone now? Or do you think that still maybe exists with some no, people? I think it like exists. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there are people who are trying just to ignore the war. Although, I mean, they understand the danger of ignoring the war. But uh, it's more difficult to, to live like Sergej now. I have been following people who decided to stay in Avdivka. They were first, uh, I mean, like two months ago, there were 1,164 persons. Uh, no kids. Kids were finally removed by the volunteers and taken to safety. But the older people, the middle-aged people, and I was trying to understand, are they all pro-Russians and they are waiting for Russian army to come and they are ready to die under Russian shelling? Or are they people who just cannot imagine leaving the town uh, or the apartment, the house where they spent all their lives? They don't want to leave the cemeteries where their re relations are buried, etc. And in the end, actually, it's interesting because Russians managed to take uh, only three interviews out of these 900 people those three were obviously waiting for Russians to come. And the other 800 plus, I mean, where are they? What they are thinking? What are they doing now, actually? When I mean, they are happy that uh, there is no bombardment in the bombing, so they can go out and breathe air. I don't believe there is fresh air after uh, so many thousands of tons of explosives detonating there. But what are they thinking? What are they thinking about their future? Because this is not the end of the war. 
But of course, there are villages next to Avdiivka where people live and they don't want to go away because everything they have, it's there. It's there. They don't want to go not knowing where to go, who will help them, where to live, how to get money for food, etc. And these people, what struck me was Sergeyich and Pashka. They might have loyalties towards different sides, but that's not necessarily the most important thing about them. That's just one aspect of their personality. So Sergeyich lives on Lenin Street and Pashka lives on Shevchenko Street. And then Sergeyich gets drunk and swaps the signs around. Is that Were you trying to sort of show these that identity isn't a simple, pure, you are this or you are this well, at I mean, many levels? In, in Ukraine, nothing is simple. And Ukrainian uh, mentality is very different from Russian mentality. Ukrainians are individualists. And they are used to argue. They are used to defend their point of view. And they pay attention to smallest difference in opinion that they can have with you. So they can 99% agree with you Once they will mention this 1% and then we'll, they will make a big deal out of it. <laughs> Can I ask one more thing about Grey Bees? I, when I was reading this, it made me sit up, which wasn't a good idea on the night train because it's not a lot of space. <laughs> But it's when Sergeyich is dreaming. He, I think he's lying on his bee bed and he's dreaming. And he's dreaming of a bombardment. And it says, it says, fireworks, he realized in amazement. Then he felt someone's presence nearby. He turned his head in the direction of this presence and saw Pashka, his frenemy. What's this about? He asked Pashka. Victory, Pashka replied joyfully. Victory. And who won? Sergeyich asked. Then frozen fear when he saw another rocket explode and rain its little fires down onto him. He pressed his back into the bee bed. But the fires died out long before they reached the hives. Don't know, Pashka said. Doesn't matter. Main thing is victory. The war's over. But which war, Sergeyich said, remembering his neighbors arguing about Hitler in his dream. The future war, said Pashka. Future war, Sergeyich repeated in confusion, and he began to rise. That, I, I still don't know what I make of that passage, so I just wanted to ask what inspired that. And I know that some critics have sort of said that some other pieces of your books end up foreshadowing things that are happening. And here in The War in Donbass, you're writing about this potential future war. Is this what you envisage? Well, I was writing this novel in 2017. Before that time, I went three times to Donbass, to the war zone. Once, actually, I traveled along all the front line, 430 kilometers to Russian border, to town Severodonetsk, which was seven kilometers away from the front line. And, uh, I mean, it was clear that uh, this frozen war is not going to stay forever like this. And Russia will never be happy with Crimea, which is not acknowledged legally by the world. So they will attack Ukraine. They will demand that Ukraine says that Ukraine is happy that part of its territory is stolen, but it will be enough for Russia to claim legally all the occupied or annexed territories. So for me, there was no miracle or no surprise that full-scale invasion started, although I didn't expect this scale of it. You mentioned earlier the sort of militancy of the Ukrainian cultural scene. Obviously, you've spoken about this before, the, the idea of cancellation, because you write primarily in Russian in your um, novels. Could you talk a little bit about what happened to you and your reaction to it? No, my books are on sale mm. in Ukrainian. Mm. My books are not published now in Russian because bookshops don't want to sell books in Russian because Putin actually turned Russian language into language of the enemy in spite of the fact that 30-40% of Ukrainians are Russian speakers. But now lots of people are changing the language, switching into Ukrainian. There are writers who change the language. I mean, the most famous Russian language novelist from Donetsk, Vladimir Rafienko, he was, because of Putin, two times a refugee. He had to survive three weeks under occupation near Bucha, and it was a miracle that he survived with his wife. And after that, he said that he will never write a word in Russian in his life. So this is the situation. I mean, I, I didn't suffer like him. I mean, Russian is still my mother tongue, I write fiction in Russian, and I will. I write nonfiction in Ukrainian and in English. And I learned Ukrainian in the Soviet time 
actually, when I was 14, 15, and I worked as an editor of the translations from foreign languages into Ukrainian in Ukrainian state publishing house. So nobody can accuse me that I'm a Russian chauvinist who doesn't want to learn Ukrainian. <laughs> I even wrote poetry in Ukrainian many, many years ago. Andre, you mentioned there you have written poetry in Ukrainian. You can write in both languages, Russian and Ukrainian. Could you give our listeners and myself, Adley and Jack here, who are not Ukrainian speakers, not Russian speakers, your sense of how the languages differ, similar, um, what do you enjoy about both? Well, they're very different, and there are lots of uh, similar things, of course, uh, if we talk about vocabulary. But uh, the easiest way to understand the difference between Russian and Ukrainian is to compare them with uh, Dutch and German. So, I mean, all Ukrainians understand Russian. Not everybody will speak Russian, but they understand. Russians in Russia think they understand Ukrainian, but they understand 50%. Russian or ethnic Russians or Russian speakers in Ukraine understand maybe more, 70%, 80%. But the best books in Ukrainian are written in dialects because the dialects of Ukrainian are extremely rich. And they are influenced by Romanian language, by Hungarian, by Polish. And the main dialects are Bukovina, which is on the border with Moldova and Romania, and Halitsky dialect, Galicina, Western Ukrainian Lviv region dialect. And in Russia, actually, nothing is written in dialects. The dialects in Russia are very weak, and they are only spoken. And they are like accent. They are not really separate sub-languages. <laughs> That's really interesting. Your work has been banned in Russia. Do you ever think in the future that there could be any reconciliation between yourself and the country that's banned your work? How do you feel about that? How do you think about that I'm now? so detached now. I mean, I'd, I'm not interested in Russian culture. And I was not interested already for many years. I was following until maybe 2004 what is happening in Russian literature and then in the end, actually, I was I was invited several times to come to Russia to give talks. Last time I was in Ural Mountains in 2013. And I had a very strange feeling because I was giving a talk and answering questions in Russian. And I understood that we don't understand each other with people who were asking me in Russian. And it was not a linguistical question. It was actually a political, psychological question. They were asking me, using the notions and the terms and the ideas from 40 years ago, 50 years ago. What did you say to them? Well, I was trying to explain to them what is today's Ukraine, and, and, they, and they were not accepting it. Some of them were thinking that I am brainwashed and sent to tell them that Ukraine is not what Ukraine in reality is. <laughs> And of course, what was very unpleasant for them uh, that uh, I write in Russian, I am probably now the the most known Russian language writer from both <laughs> Ukraine and Russia. <laughs> and so in the end, actually, there were articles against me in Russian media saying that I'm a very bad writer who writes only in order to become famous. Oh, wow. <laughs> What do you think, going back to Ukraine, what do you think the future for Russian speakers and Russian writers looks like in contemporary Ukraine? Well, not much future, definitely. Uh, but uh, for me, Ukraine is a multicultural country, as for many others. And uh, writers in Ukraine write in Hungarian, in Gagauz language, in Crimean Tatar language. So, of course, the only state language is Ukrainian. So when Ukrainians are talking about literature, they mean only Ukrainian language literature. There will be niche for Russian language literature. I don't know, will it be a ghetto or will it be a sort of kind of club literature, closed community literature? It will survive. We have lots of very good poets who write in, in Russian. We have a lot of bilingual poets, actually, uh, who write in both uh, Russian and Ukrainian, as I did in 1980s. Uh, so uh, Russian will not disappear from the streets because it's language of daily life of many regions and districts. And especially people who are not 
educated, but they were brought up Russian speakers. From the Ukrainian stubbornness, they will keep Russian language <laughs> and they will defend it. <laughs> it's not the intellectuals, uh, Russian speaking intellectuals, were never defending Russian language. <laughs> They're just keeping quiet. <laughs> They're working in it. <laughs> but it's funny because those who are involved sometimes in linguistic debates and scandals on the street, They are ordinary people. They're not intellectuals. Over the past two years, in the full-scale war, we've seen the murder, the death of numerous Ukrainian poets, writers. I'm thinking of, I mean, we were doing an interview earlier today about the life of Victoria Amelina, who was killed in a rocket strike in Kramatorsk. Uh, Maxim Hristov, a poet, joined the army and was, was killed. And To me, it feels like there's a pattern from, for example, the 1930s, the executed Renaissance, Stalin's purge of Ukrainian intellectuals and musicians. Do you see that pattern as well? Do you think that there are links between what's happened before and today? Well, the war is the link because, I mean, this war is more than 300 years old. The first probably battle over this war is Poltava battle, 1709, when Peter the Great defeated Ukrainian army of Hetman Mazepa and Swedish army of Karl XII, who was helping Ukrainians to get back <laughs> their territories. So Ukrainians were always fighting. They were always thinking about independence and separate future from Russia, and they were always punished for that. In fact, the executed Renaissance writers, they were all communists. They were leftists. They believed, actually, in what Lenin promised them. So, I mean, they, they believed that they can develop Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian literature inside Soviet literature. But still, they went too far. They were very talented. They believed in their success so much that actually one of them became, at some point, one of three best-read Soviet writers. I'm talking about uh, Hvilovy. We should understand that at the same time, lots of writers from other republics were killed, and also Russian language writers, although I think probably many Russian language writers survived, because being a Ukrainian writer, it meant already a lot, and it was already a danger. Bringing us back then to today, we're just a few days out from the second anniversary of the full-scale invasion, how will you mark that moment? We're two years into a war which you say was 300 years old and looks like it, there's no end in sight at the moment. Well, people were marking the February killings of the Maidan protesters several days ago. They went uh, up the alley of heroes from Maidan towards the parliament I don't think people will mark the anniversary of full-scale invasion. They could have marked it if there was success on the front, but now actually there is more. There are more reasons for concern than for joy. Uh, so uh, I think people just will think about this. So it, it is not any kind of celebration. It's just another reason to try to understand what is happening and where it goes. Just going back again to your point, that you said earlier, this conflict goes back to the Battle of Poltava. With a conflict this long, with so much history and so much suffering, how does something like this end? What needs to happen, do you think, for this to end? Well, something should happen to Russia. The, Russia should stop being empire. Britain wanted to stay empire, but in the end, actually, Great Britain accepted a more civilized way of life and more civilized way of relationship with ex-colonies. And I think Commonwealth is a good example how to keep ties and friendships, not without difficulty, of course, but still. And uh, Russia is fighting with the ex-territories of the Soviet Union. Russia is taking revenge. And it's all because of this KGB generation of Putin who cannot imagine that Russia can be a normal country. So, I mean, he likes Trump because he likes the idea that uh, you can come and say, let's make America great again, and you will get majority of votes. Putin wants to make Russia great again, and that's why he supported by Russians, who voluntarily actually rejected the freedoms they had after 1991. 
What would you say to people in the West? I mean, we're seeing a lot at the moment that various countries are unsure whether they will send aid to Ukraine. There's obviously the aid bill in Congress, which has not been passed. With your experience of Russia and Ukraine, your experience of Putin, what would you say to them? What do you think they should know about the nature of this regime and this man? Well, I mean, he will not give up. Putin will not give up. While he is alive, he will be Tsar in Russia. He will be fighting against the West in Ukraine. If he manages to destroy Ukraine, he will fight against the West in Moldova, in Lithuania, in Poland. And uh, European leaders, politicians should understand that this is actually the potential Third World War. And it will reshape Europe and European Union. It will reshape borders. It will change borders first time after the Second World War. And it will create a very negative pattern. Potential dictators and uh, far right and far left will understand that actually if they are successful populists, they can get into power and they can get the mechanisms of war running even in the heart of Europe. So, I mean, it's time to stop being naive only because of this naivety. Europe was not producing ammunition and weapon and the European leaders, even the generals, were thinking that this kind of 20th century war style is over. We will not need artillery, shells. We will just deal and use a diplomatic negotiations and will the commerce will replace any kind of other political dealings and talks. Can I ask the same question, but with a different focus? We've been doing this work for almost two years, looking at the war in Ukraine, looking at Ukrainian society, trying to understand it, trying to reflect that understanding out to the rest of the primarily English-speaking world. That's who our audience are. What would you want our listeners to understand about Ukrainian society that maybe you think so far we have not really understood? What would be your takeaway? Well, Ukrainians were always different, like Lithuanians were always different. So this idea that somehow the Soviet Union was a homogeneous collection of people and cultures is a product of Soviet propaganda, which was resurrected by Putin. From 2014 until 2022, the West thought that this is internal conflict between ex-relatives, between ex-husband and ex-wives. And they were accepting actually this violence, which was already then quite striking in Ukraine. They were accepting it as a family quarrel. And only from a full-scale invasion moment, they realize that it's it's much more serious. And uh, to understand it is, uh, I mean, there are wonderful books on Ukrainian history, nonfiction books by Sergei Plohi, Timothy Snyder, and Applebaum. Philip Sands wrote a wonderful book, East-West Street, which is about Europe and Ukraine, and about, of course, two very well-known Jewish-Ukrainian lawyers the authors of terms genocide and crime against humanity. But generally, the main thing is that Ukrainian history is not part of Russian history. Russia actually thinks it owns Ukraine, Ukrainian history. And uh, of course, Russia does understand that Russia cannot own Ukrainian culture. That's why Russia is happy to destroy Ukrainian culture. I have one more question about your writing before we start to wrap up. The descriptions in Grey Bees of the artillery and the the fighting, which occasionally there are moments when shells do land in the village. There's a moment where a a sniper's nest is blown up in in a neighbouring house. Often the action takes place just over the next hill, or there's shelling 10 kilometres distance down the road. How do you approach writing about war? Do you find it difficult to describe the sort of extreme violence that we saw in 2014 to now? Well, I saw bodies of killed protesters on Maidan in 2014, and uh, I saw dead people in Donbass. I mean, I don't like to describe violent things and to describe realistically what one can see in the war. 
For me, it's much more important to describe what happens in a person's head and thoughts when he's facing the war and its consequences. What do you think Sergeyevich might be doing now if he was still alive after the full-scale invasion and Pashka? I mean, he probably would not be alive because he is not somebody who would escape from the war. He would expect that the war will pass by and disappear in somewhere far away behind horizon. So for him, it's impossible to live outside his village, outside Donbass. Andre Kirkov, is there anything we haven't spoken about that you think is important for our listeners to hear? Uh, not sure, but uh, for me this war is extremely visual because now with today's technology, many soldiers are filming their battles and uh, Telegram channels and YouTube is full of the videos of real battles, real deaths, uh, real fighting. And I think if uh, your listeners, some of them, still don't understand what is today's war and how it is done, I would advise them to find a couple of videos or at least to watch the film, which was recently awarded by BAFTA, 20 Days in Mariupol. It is a documentary. So, I mean, we are living in the time when war is shown live online. And uh, this is abnormality. But this is also a good reason to check these videos in order to have a proper allergy against any violence, military or otherwise. Andre, thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. We'll sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine The Latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. This episode of Ukraine The Latest was produced by Adley pushman Ponte, Jack Lather and Elliot Lampett. And the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.